Hello YouTube, I am Prince Dustpan, and welcome back to Simpsons Month. I am very excited for what's to come. I figured I would start this month off with a look at what I believe to be the 10 <clears throat> best episodes ever. So, of course, as with most top ten lists, these choices are completely subjective and mostly arbitrary. These are my personal opinions. They will most definitely differ from yours. There's over 27 seasons of shows to choose from, so to make things a little easier, I have restricted myself to just the 17 seasons that are released on DVD. And, to be perfectly honest, as far as the 10 best episodes go, I wasn't going to pick anything after season 17 anyway. Would you? Come on. Let's get started! Number 10. The 138th episode Spectacular. Yes, this is a clip show that made the top 10. Because, well, quite frankly, when it first aired, I didn't even realize it was a clip show. Granted, I was about seven or eight years old, it's pretty easy to fool kids, but it was a well-made show, and dare I say it, the best clip show ever made. Because it wasn't just relying on clips that we've seen before. They tried to do something a little more unique, a little more special with it, and they used deleted scenes, they used rarely seen footage, behind the scenes stuff, they, they, it was still a clip show, it was still about 10% new material, but they managed to make everything old shown seem like it was new. They presented things as montages, sort of a greatest hits of Simpsons moments, and they showed, yeah, a lot of deleted scenes, scenes that never made it to air which made it very unique for the time. Come on, come on, girls! Shake, shake, shake! Smithers, it's out of control! Don't take him out, sir! Quite frankly, I didn't even realize it was a clip show until I watched it on DVD with the commentary where the director states categorically, yes, this is a clip show, but it's the best clip show ever. And I have to agree. Now, the advent of DVDs, including special features and deleted scenes, have made episodes like this completely useless. But for the time, it was a valuable thing. And it stands out. So, it's on the list. Very low, but it deserves a spot on the list. Number 9. Homer at the Bat. This episode has no real emotional core, no deep meaning or philosophical musings, but it does have lots and lots of celebrity guests, all of them baseball players. Please say hello to Steve Sachs, Don Mattingly, Daryl Strawberry, Ozzy Smith, Mike Sosha, and Jose Canseco. Whoa. 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 Who genuinely give their all in their performance. They're not phoning in their lines, they're genuinely excited to be there, and you can tell that they're having a good time, and that makes a big difference in an episode. If it sounds like the voice actors are enjoying themselves, it helps you to enjoy it more, too. Each of their characters are given unique personality traits. They're not just big names thrown in for quick attention. They actually cared about the story, and all of the celebrity guests genuinely cared about giving the best performance that they could. And that makes a big difference. I'm not sure if I like this episode because I'm a huge baseball fan, or if I became a huge baseball fan because of this episode. Either way, it's a fun, frivolous, entertaining episode, 
and definitely worth watching. There's no reason not to like it. Number 8. 22 Short Films About Springfield. I love it when shows give incidental characters more major roles. And I love it when shows with established structure break from the mold and experiment. 22 Short Films is all of that and more. It is so absurd, even the title is a lie. There aren't 22 short films, but it doesn't matter. It gives you the idea, and it feels like 22 short films because there's so much going on. For the next five minutes, I'm going to party like it's on sale for $19.99. Some stories have title sequences, some don't. Some have structure, others are a slice of life with no purpose. Some exist just to bridge the gap between other stories. It's fast-paced, fun, and hilarious. Definitely uh, worth uh, your time. Oh, sorry I'm late. <laughs> well, oh, no, wait, please, no. Please, I have a funny story, if you listen. Number seven. Yeah. Homer's Triple <laughs> Bypass. More. Thank you. This is an example of how the Simpsons in their prime could take any story, any subject matter, and make it fun and entertaining. Even a story about a father of three having a heart attack and undergoing a triple coronary artery bypass graft. So the tiny aorta fairies will take Mr. Legvane on a long trip to get married to Princess Left Ventricle. Dad, are you trying to tell us you're getting a coronary artery bypass graft? Uh, yeah. See, it's funny, because he could die and they'd grow up without a father. You can do so much more with animation than you ever could with live actors, and that gives The Simpsons the freedom to experiment and come up with these kinds of bizarre stories that would never be considered funny in any other form. Plus, this episode has some of the funniest drawings, some amazing freeze-frame moments. There's some charming backstory, hilarious flashback sequences, and as well as just some charming moments sprinkled throughout the whole thing. The Simpsons is the only show I can think of that can go from a scene as off the wall and hilarious as this. Come on, come on. Directly into something as deep and serious as this. But don't worry because you've got a big brother who loves you and will always look out for you. <laughs> oh, Dad and still manage to keep the audience entertained and coming back for more. Number six. Huh? El viaje misterioso de nuestro Homer. Sunrise, sunset. Rise, sunset. Sunrise, sunset. Sunrise, sunset. Sunrise, sunset. Johnny Cash as a space coyote. What more do you need to know? All right, okay. It also has some amazing dream sequence animation, a storyline inspired by the works of Carlos Castaneda, some of the most memorable lines, and hilarious moments like this. It's chili! Oh my God, I'm missing the chili cook-off! I'm missing the cook-off! It's going on right now, and I'm missing it! And a feel-good ending that leaves you understanding more and more of just why Homer and Marge are still together after all these years. Number five. Two cars in every garage and three eyes on every fish. Is your boss governor yet? Not yet, son, not yet. It's been speculated that you could recreate several famous movies using only clips from The Simpsons. More specifically, Godfather and Citizen Kane. And a lot of the Citizen Kane ones come from this very episode. Mr. Burns runs for governor in an almost beat-for-beat -beat parody of the movie. Minus, of course, the 
three-eyed fish plot thread. Ugh, I hate that fish! Which was masterfully woven into the storyline by the writers. Little did they realize that that fish would become an iconic image of the show, becoming synonymous with The Simpsons altogether, even if they don't use it too often anymore. This is yet another example of how the earlier episodes of The Simpsons were able to weave charming, heartwarming, emotional stories with hilarity ensuing. Oh yeah? Well, I'm a burns booster! Ow! There's just a feel, a, a warmth, a indescribable idea that comes with these earlier episodes, this one being a prime example. Spectacular writing, an emotional core, a lot of funny moments, all overarching with a movie parody. It just feels like they were trying a lot harder back then, and it really shows. Number four. Two bad neighbors. Are you saying you and Barbara are bad neighbors? No, that's not Bar and me, it's them. Who? Maud and me? No, the man and his boy. You know, the, the boy is named Bart. I don't know the name of the man. This is an episode that has disappointed a lot of people particularly those of a certain generation. You have an episode here that involves George H.W. Bush, a man who in real life publicly criticized The Simpsons on more than one occasion. We are going to keep on trying to strengthen the American family to make American families a lot more like the Waltons and a lot less like The Simpsons. Huh? Moving in to a house across the street from Homer and Marge. You have the perfect setup for all all manner of political satire. And they don't deliver on that. They subvert the expectation of the average viewer. And this upset a lot of people. Harry Shearer, the actor who voices George Bush in this episode, was reportedly baffled by the script and didn't understand what was supposed to be funny about it. He, he wanted more political humor. But by not giving the audience what it expects, it instead gives the audience something truly remarkable. An apolitical, traditional sitcom-style send-up of Dennis the Menace, of all things, with George Bush as Mr. Wilson. Hello, Mr. Bush! This episode gets so absurd that at one point, Homer and Bart are walking through the sewer with a crate of locusts as George Bush jumps down into the sewer and proceeds to engage Homer in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it happens so gradually that you see this occur and you think, yeah, this seems reasonable. The script for this episode is an absurdist masterpiece, defying expectation and dividing its audience. And if you ever get the chance, watch this one with the commentary. One of the writers tells an amazing story of his life where he happened to live near George Bush back when he worked for the CIA. It's worth listening to. Number three. Other Simpson. Oh, my little homie bear. This episode should have won an Emmy. And there's no doubt in, honestly, anyone's mind that it definitely would have if they had submitted it. Instead, that year, they chose to submit their Halloween episode because they had 3D computer graphics and they wanted to show off the technology that they used. Oh, heavenly testament to the eternal majesty of God's creation. Holy macaroni! Yeah. At the time, this was a big deal. Still, in hindsight, Mother Simpson was the clear and obvious choice. Pinky in the brain wouldn't have held a candle to this episode. There is no episode of the show made before or since, with more heart, more genuine emotion that still retains that trademark Simpson zaniness. Glenn Close is pitch perfect as Homer Simpson's mother. Plus, any excuse to show young Homer flashbacks is 
always appreciated. Sing me my bedtime song, Mom. Ooey gooey, rich and chewy inside. Golden flaky tender cakey outside. Wrap the inside in the outside. Is it good? Doing the big, 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 big new day. Here's the tricky part. We also get a great look into the younger lives of many Springfielders. The whole script is just expertly crafted to keep you guessing and keep you laughing at the same time. Remember, whatever happens, you have a mother and she's truly proud of you. Mm. It's those little moments that make the show stand out in history. Opting to include a nearly static shot of Homer sitting on his car watching the sun go down instead of the traditional black, boring end credits. The little shooting star at the very end to make it all worthwhile. Number two. Simple villages, I promise you I will close plates in America and bring work here. Viva, Senor Burns! Viva! Viva! A star is Burns. Before I begin with this one, I feel I need to inform you about a little show called The Critic. A wonderful little gem of a cartoon killed long before its time by a vindictive studio executive. John Lovitz and a cast of the most talented voice actors in the business in a show created by former Simpsons producers all about movies? Yes, please! The show managed one short season on CBS before being moved to the Fox Network for a second. To increase viewership, the Fox Network decided to introduce the character Jay Sherman on an episode of The Simpsons. Uh-oh, I smell another cheap cartoon crossover. Bart Simpson, meet Jay Sherman the Critic. Hello. Hey man, I really love your show. I think all kids should watch it. <laughs> I suddenly feel so dirty. This leads not only to the greatest crossover in animation history, but also to a great reunion of some of the best producers in the business. There are so many great moments, quotable lines. On closer inspection, these are loafers. I was saying boo-urns. Gorgeous images, as well as hideous ones. I adore this episode. There's just simply too much here to talk about in a short blurb. The best thing you can do is watch it for yourself. And again, if you have the opportunity with this one, watch it with the commentary. John Lovitz riffing with Dan Castellaneta and Simpsons producers is an indescribable thing. I think we have a winner. What I miss. And the number one Simpsons episode is Last Exit to Springfield. Go too far and get corrupt and shiftless, and the Japanese will eat us alive. The Japanese? Those sandal-wearing goldfish tenders? <laughs> Bush flimsha. I know this seems like a strange choice. This episode isn't particularly sentimental or even that famous. At least not around here, anyway. I never even saw the thing until years later. I missed this episode when it first aired. I was only four years old. And for some reason, my local Fox affiliate never, ever showed it in reruns. They'd show Mr. Plow three times in one month, but rarely would they dip into the more cerebral episodes of the early seasons. I never really got a chance to see this episode until the DVDs came out. And it's a real shame because when I finally did see it, I was so thoroughly impressed. This episode is layers of comedy upon drama, upon storytelling, upon different kinds of comedy. This episode was made just before Al Jean and Mike Reese broke away to make The Critic. You can tell the new show is on their minds by the sheer number of movie references, both subtle and direct. The show starts with a general parody of all Schwarzenegger films. Human misery. <laughs> To see you. Then gives us Marathon Man, Yellow Submarine, 
Batman, Godfather, Tucker, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and I'm sure I missed a few more. It also features one of the most touching, beautiful, and also funniest moments ever. Come gather round children, it's high time he learns about a hero named Homer and a devil named Burns. That little scene is impressive in another way. Rather than sending the scene to Korea for in-betweening, it was personally drawn by an animator who played guitar. So the chord structure would be accurate. Now do classical gas. Even just the fact that Lisa plays classical gas, it just makes me smile every time. And the way that Lenny bobs his head to it is perfect. This attention to detail is one of the things that separates The Simpsons from other shows, and it's what makes this episode significantly more impressive than other ones. Add to that some of the backstory you get from watching the DVD commentary. This character was originally going to be played by Anthony Perkins. How perfect would that have been? Unfortunately, Perkins died shortly before recording began and Hank Azaria stepped into the role. Doing a wonderful job, but just imagine how much better this scene could be if Norman Bates were wearing that white coat. Hold still while I gas you. All of these things add up to one of the most memorable and enjoyable episodes ever made. There's a richness, a depth to the story, a, a warmth to the animation. It's early enough in the series that they're still trying really hard. I don't know what it is, and maybe it's mostly a personal thing with me. If you were to ask me, even years ago, if you were to ask me what the best episode of The Simpsons was, out of five, six hundred plus episodes that they've done at this point, still, Last Exit to Springfield from season four stands out head and shoulders above the rest. So that's my list. Like it? Hate it? Agree? Disagree? Let me know in the comments below. Always interested in knowing what other people think is the best episode. And, uh, stick around. Lots more Simpsons Month to come. <laughs>